Hey, hello, this is Silas for Rantaton. I've got my friend here. I'm Steven Kirshner. Yeah, uh, we just, this is the second one in the line of talks that I had. The first one was on private property. I had that with my friend Nick. Uh, with Steven, we've been friends for almost two years now. Is it almost two years? Yeah, I think that sounds about right, yeah. We met through a mutual, a mutual... A mutual um, friend kind of through, not meet up exactly, but it was like she reached out and then... Yeah. You, we met at the same time, yeah. I think I met her at a meetup. It was through a philosophy group that we listened to, Free Domain Radio, I'm yep. to say. But, um, so we met through that, and now we've been we've been talking about different topics and had yeah. a lot of really <clears throat> interesting conversations. Mm-hmm. And Actually, there was a time when they were, <laughs> the friend in, uh-huh. that was being mentioned had started a YouTube channel and we were walking, working on that. That's been yeah. uh, in development hell, as they say. We've been, try- <laughs> we've been trying to do it, but, you know... We both work a lot, schedules differ, it's just, it's been very tough to coordinate. Yeah, so we've had a lot of different conversations about a lot of different topics, mm-hmm. both online and in person, and yep. with this series, I just want to continue the whole conversations about different things, so the topic today is going to be, you are what you eat. Mm-hmm. So, in that sense, <clears throat> of course, there's just the dieting, the aspect of it, we just wanted to yeah. break up on the, on that, but... I had proposed that also, I pen my hair, but I had also proposed that um, humans themselves were more than just our physical selves. Mm-hmm. You know, we are also, our mind is what makes us human, what I yep. think. So food is not necessarily just calories and vitamins and proteins, but what you ingest is also the ideas and the thoughts. So you are what you eat. We're going to kind of that's a general uh, yeah, structure general of what theme we of the discussion. Yeah. But yeah. So, um, I thought Stephen was going to be a really good person to talk about this because he's he's really he's a voracious um, eater eater <laughs> of information and also food himself. And I also <laughs> like to eat. I cook, but definitely not to the level as Stephen has. As for, for those that don't um, know, I uh, I graduated from the Culinary Institute of America in 2009. I wanted to be a chef for many years, but of course, working in the industry, I found out that wasn't for me. Um, since then, I've been doing front of the house, food running, serving, etc. Uh, I also work as a sales rep for a seafood company, so I'm just involved with food in general. Uh, I'm still, I'm very passionate about the subject. I still want to work in a kitchen 70, 80 hours a week. Yeah. And that, working for the food rep was, there was, uh, we were at a meetup and I was introducing him to a friend of mine, mutual, a friend of mine that I met mm-hmm. some year, a year back or so, two years back or so. But he was telling him about the, the his, his job as a food rep and just talking about the different kinds of fish. And I was just listening to the conversation and really enthralled by it. I mean... People, of course, you watch some Discovery Channels like The Deadliest Catch yeah, and you see the things Shark like that. Week, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I've he, always been a big fan of that. Yeah. <laughs> but he was going into the different kinds of fish and my friend was... He, he actually knew a lot about fish. He was surprised me also. I mean, I, not that I had any idea to know the level right. of yeah. fish he'd know. But they were discussing different kinds of fish, different kinds of fish that are used for sushi and the qualities and... Different lines. species of like, for example, salmon is like a general category. I don't know if it, I don't know if it's genus or which one it technically falls under. But then you have like, you know, Atlantic salmon, Pacific salmon, sockeye. You know, all those different divisions. Yeah. Uh, you have seasonality, of course. Like sockeye, like certain, like the sockeye salmon we have from Alaska, which my boss swears is like one of the best ever. You can only get it a few months in the summer, and then it's out because it spawns during that time. And it's in these rivers, you catch it, then it goes out to sea and moves around. and yeah. yeah. So things like that, yeah. Okay, so now, what I was thinking with that fish and just the fact that... Okay, with the you are what you eat thing. Mm-hmm. People with dieting... Um, okay, we're here in America and... Right. The... Nutrition in is, is an issue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's definitely. No, <laughs> there's an obesity epidemic... But in the physical sense, people are physically overweight. Right. You know, now we're going to touch on the fat acceptance movement, which is a horrible, horrible yeah. thing. Yeah. None of us support that here. No, no, no. If you're going to be body positive and all that, you can be positive about that. But if you are body positive, I am almost positive you're going to get offended sometime <laughs> in this conversation. Yeah. So just yeah. letting you know that right now. 
<laughs> Heads but, up, trigger warning. Yes. <laughs> I might put like some guns in like after birth. But <laughs> no, that would be too triggered. That would be actually trigger trigger warning. But um we're talking about the food thing. So there's there's obesity where you're just getting too much nutrition, yeah. too much food, physical food. Well, it's a matter of what. I don't know if I'd say it's too much nutrition, but it's too many. It's too many calories overall, but it's too much of the wrong kind of food. Yes. Like, you know, you can you could binge eat celery. Celery is a negative calorie food. You actually burn more calories chewing it than you ingest. Oh. So, like, you you know, you could. I don't know how you would eat too much celery. I mean, you'd be in the bathroom all the time, <laughs> but you you wouldn't be morbidly obese from it. Yeah. But if you eat, you know. Steak, every steak, bacon, every meal, ice cream. So, you know, obviously, okay, that's... Uh. So, there's a lot of things, I think, surrounding with that. So now you have people not being aware of the foods that they're eating yeah. and eating too much, like you said, too many calories. Yeah. There's all this access to it. And why... We've, we've of course, discussed this, but what is the general drive for people to want calorie-dense foods? Well, I, I think a lot of it started, um, I've talked to my mom a bit about this too, because she's both worked and stayed at home. So we talked about the whole convenience thing that started in the fifties or so, whereas it used to be like, okay, you had a woman stayed at home. She cleaned, she got a meal going like partway into the afternoon, you ate at a certain time and so on. But when women start going to work, it's okay, we can't do this anymore. We have to find some sort of convenience. So that's when you had TV dinners and so on. And I think part of that is it, it kind of became laziness. Like, for example, I had a chef in school who talked about how canning or like preserving used to be, okay, something's out of season, you hold on to it so you can have it all year round. But now people are just lazy and they throw a can of beans on the stove and eat it because they don't feel like properly boiling the water, blanching the beans, cooking the beans further because it takes time and energy. They'd rather take that shortcut. And again, with women going to work and if you have two parents working, I kind of understand that, but at the same time, it's like we've lost a lot of the art, like at least among the average population too. Yeah. Now, obviously not in restaurants, especially the higher end, they still do all this, but in general, it's like, originally it became, okay, there is a valid reason for this, but now it's just kind of a crutch to lean on. Like, I don't know if, I don't know if you're familiar with sous vide cooking, Silas, I'm sure <laughs> any of my, any of my culinary <laughs> friends who see this will know. So sous vide in french means under vacuum it's cooking things at a low temperature for a long period of time yeah for example you can cook short ribs for like a day or two straight literally it's like pressure cookers no, like well that. no no it's it's basically a water bath the food is in a bag you set a certain temperature it's well below boiling it could be like 120 140 something and it just goes for like a day and the idea is that the stuff is ultra tender like you can cook short ribs to medium rare and they're still super tender whereas typically if you court, cook short ribs in a in an oven on the stove whatever they have to they're going to be cooked all the way through okay so it's very low so temperature long period of time um but what, what sorry what were you gonna say what does it do to the food to do this well What's like for actual... for example with the meat it's that you can cook stuff like it's super tender like the short ribs are just like you know they talk about falling off the bone like they're super tender and it's cool too they're medium rare which is nice as well um certain vegetables you know you can cook they're very tender if that's what you're looking for consistency wise uh, not everything cooks well sous vide. Like if you cook green vegetables, that way they'll turn brown, yeah. etc. But um, they're like, for example, Thomas Keller. He's considered by a lot of people the best chef in the U.S. He wrote a book called Under Pressure, which is um, it's all about sous vide cooking. And he has fish, meat, different vegetables, and so on. All those recipes. And it's interesting because that low temperature, long period of time, you can get different results than you would from traditional cooking. But what a chef in school was saying, and I kind of agree with, is that he worries that it's going to become like a crutch that people lean on. Like yeah. it's more like, oh, I don't feel like taking the time and paying attention. I'm just going to throw something in the background and let it go. Yeah. And with then, the sous vide cooking? Yeah. Okay. Sous vide and canning too. Like, I was, like the example I brought up of, okay, canning, you can green beans so you have them in the winter because they only grow summer. But the thing is people just throw a can of green beans on in the summer because they don't feel like cooking them from fresh. Mm. So like it's become a crutch to lean on where originally it was like – Okay, we're trying to get around the seasonality and so on. Okay, so <clears throat> before we had said, I also thought sometimes, sometimes it is laziness. Sometimes I'm thinking there's certain foods. Yeah. I like to cook, <clears throat> but yeah. I actually started this thing where I like going out and buying the food every day yeah. that I'm going to cook. Yeah. I don't like keeping my food stocked with food. Yeah. There's actually multiple reasons. Like that's why I was asking this food yeah. cooking. When you cook it food in different ways, it breaks down that, that material in different ways. Yeah. So, I, I looked into what happens when you store food in the fridge. Like once a food has been killed, let's say you've killed an animal, yeah. you've plucked a fruit, 
it's rotting once that's happened. Yeah. I mean, like, that, I that's why, what I was even taught that yeah. freezing basically stops the growth of bacteria. Refrigeration only slows it. Yeah. It's a question. But with freezing, it's like, obviously, there's a certain point, and they call it freezer burn, where it dude, starts to break down the food because it's not, it can't hold at that, you know, temperature yeah. for so long. I mean, for me, you, I mean, my, my, yeah. uh, <laughs> my username here on YouTube yeah. is dying alive. You know, it's part of that process where. Yeah. Once it's no longer alive, it's dying. Yeah. So once you've plucked that food off, it's already dying. Yet, you have a situation where, what was it? Somebody, I, okay, I'm kind of losing my track, of, but somebody just pointed this out to me where they said something like rice. Like you cook rice one on, that, on the day of, you put it in the fridge, mm -hmm. and the next day it's lost something like 40% of its calories or it's gained something. So oh, I actually didn't know that. There's, there's, I'll definitely leave a link to that. Okay, I'll try sure. to find that uh, and find exactly what that person said. Maybe not just throw out things that are random, random. <laughs> but uh, getting back to the point, with foods, with the process, people not understanding exactly what they're doing with that food. Right. So in the understanding, just eating food is eating food. Yeah. Getting the, getting the nutrition in, yeah. getting the calories in to keep yourself going. <clears throat> That's what you're doing. Your body's burning energy yeah. and you're replacing that through yeah. foods. I mean, that's the base aspect of it. It's the reason we need yeah. food, yeah, fundamentally. So why, as you said with, with the celery, it takes more calories to eat the celery yeah, than, than, it you does, actually ingest, than you actually yeah. ingest it. Yeah. So why is it that we have evolved to not have that hankering for celery, but you have a hankering for big juicy fruit or big calorie dense fruit, like something like... Said, uh, well, the, ex banana, the, the explanation I've heard is that we want um, we want sweeter things because historically we were craving fruit because that was a source of like carbohydrates. But the thing, the issue now is with all these refined sugars is they cut out fiber and other things that would slow the digestion. So if you have a cake or whatever, obviously that's a very refined sugar. But the thing is that gets insulin levels high. Um, and so on and then of course you have the whole issue with like sending blood sugar up high You get the high followed by the crash as well as the fact that your body doesn't slowly process it as with fruit or something like for example It's better to have a whole fruit than fruit juice because the fiber slows down the burning of carbs Whereas the fruit juice is almost not quite like drinking sugar. It's not as high on the um, Glycemic index, but that's like the rate at which like different sugars are at different levels like I think dextrose is one of the highest and glucose is below that, and then you have like wheat or something below that. I don't, this is just off the top of my head. I would have to yeah. actually look at it. But the idea is that if you have that high glycemic stuff all the time, your blood sugar will get super high, and that's not good for you. And then, of course, that could lead to diabetes or whatever other issues down the line. But because we've stripped out, we we're like with fruit, the fruit juice analogy, like we, we don't eat fruit in its natural, um, its natural condition. We strip things out of it, and that's where the problem lies. Same thing with sugar. Like you figure... Sugar cane, it's a syrup from a plant, but they boil it down, refine it, whatever, and it's very dense, you know, or high fructose corn syrup, which is much worse, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, now this information that you know about food, we're talking about here, yeah, a lot of things. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the things that you've been saying, but <laughs> of course you can find out this I'm trying not to go on too much of a tangent, but still make <laughs> the general points, yeah. Yeah, but why, why do people not know these basic information? Like, one thing we were talking about was also the food pyramid itself, how... Mm -hmm. The, at least this is the United States of America, the yeah. food pyramid, the way it was. Now we're getting information where <clears throat> apparently that food pyramid should have been flipped over. Now, you have people... We also There was also a news story about food IQ in general. They asked, I think... I don't know how wide-ranging this study was, but we had discussed this. And they asked, like, let's say a thousand people, but they yeah. said... I think it was 25 to 40% of the people... I, I'll try to get a link to that also and leave it in the low bar... But they asked them where does chocolate milk come from, and they said it comes from brown, brown cows. cows. Yeah, I've seen so, that, yeah. So I mean, people don't know what they're ingesting, right. and I think there is something. Another ad added thing was in cities. I found out when I was when I was in high school, the city I was in, which is Bethesda, Maryland. They said if you close it off from the trucks, from the trucks delivering yeah. the food, the food would run out in that in that city, in that area, in about a day. Wow. Now. Nothing is produced locally, it's yes. all brought in. Nothing from is produced okay. locally. People don't understand. People are not aware. If you tell them onions grow in trees, which they don't, they're roots. <laughs> uh, if you tell them these things about uh, food. I, I had a boss who thought that cherries grew in bogs. He was mixing them up with cranberries. Wait, he, but 
was he, he this was in the food industry right? yeah and okay, the, the, so... this the, but this was funny because i remember he was like he's like have you ever seen cherries grow they grow in bogs i'm like you're thinking of cranberries he's like oh what do cherries grow and i'm like cherry trees he's <laughs> like and i was like you don't you need that old parable it's not actually true but it gets repeated about george washington and the cherry tree you yeah. know all that and i was like if you ever go to cape cod you can see the cranberry bogs it, it's kind of interesting as an aside like they don't really they don't grow in the water like you see on the ocean spray commercial it's more like they kind of grow in this like Oh, they look almost like puddles, but then yeah. when they harvest them, they flood out those bogs, and then they all float to the top. That's how they get them. But if you go, if you go there, like maybe like spring, earlier summer, you'll see these like low bogs, and the berries are in there. It's kind of cool. They're not ripe yet, but that's where they go. Huh. Okay, <clears throat> so I want to tie in this: the lack of food IQ and what you ingest, being who you are, yeah, being who makes you physically, yeah, you know. When it comes to diets, I've kind of thought of, like you were talking about your mom fed you certain foods when you were growing up. Yeah. This is a general thing where people used to eat at home. People used to learn what was good for them. Yeah. And whatever made your parents healthy. This is one thing I think of with, with diets. The best kind of diet might be an ancestral diet where you just find out what did the people, what did your ancestors <clears throat> eat when they were evolving right. before they had access to modern medicine. Well, that's kind of what the paleo diet is, yeah. right? I don't know enough about it, but I think that's kind of the old idea behind I th it. I think that is part of <clears throat> that is definitely part of the reason, or part of it behind mm -hmm. that, because they're like, okay, these were the foods that made humans physically resistant to diseases before they had the medicines yeah. to do it. Because now you could literally eat anything. You could eat hot dogs all day, every yeah. day, and just get a multivitamin and get something else. You know, I've also thought sometimes instead of cooking, if they could just give you like a block, nondescript block of all the nutrients that you need and just ingest well, that. It's kind of like the Matrix feeding yeah. them that, you know, stuff. <laughs> and you also kind of think, like, I was also thinking, like, if you had, like, in Star, Star Wars, when they have the replicator, what is that food actually being made of? Like, is yeah. it just a like, huge vat of just... I don't know. What would it be? Like, they, they explain this. It's I'll some combination of minerals this. and vitamins and whatever. Yeah. But then the issue becomes that they have to extract that from something. Like, something my dad taught me, and, you know, I've, of course, believe now is, you know, it's ridiculous people buy white bread, but then they buy vitamins for nutrition, whereas the whole wheat actually contains everything. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Ezekiel bread. I don't know if you've had that, but it's, um, for those that don't know, it's, um, it's based on the book of Ezekiel in the Bible. It's what he supposedly ate in the desert as he had to go through it. It's made up of like, let's see, what is it? Millet, spelt, quinoa, barley. There's a few different things, but all those combined form a complete protein, but it's also a slow burning carb. So it's the best of both worlds. Yeah. The idea is like, okay, you can walk through the desert, you know, you have energy, but it can also build muscle mass. So, you know, again, it, it depends on what your religious beliefs are, how much you believe this, whatever, but you can still buy that bread in health stores or whatever, but something like that's very good for you. Whereas triple bleached, you know, Wonder Bread or whatever. It's just flour with most of the stuff taken out of it. <laughs> you know, it's like... And then it's like, oh, I'm going to take a vitamin to get the nutrition. It's kind of, yeah. you know, counterproductive. <laughs> okay, so wait, I'm going to try to pivot a bit off of just the nutrition aspect. We've talked about that a lot. I think we'll come back to that, to the food industry and all that too. But now let's go to the mental aspect, to what makes you who you are mentally. Like, what's what builds up your thought process? What builds up your... I don't know if it's your id or ego. I don't know those things. The three things. Yeah, using Freudian psychology yes. or whatever. So <laughs> what builds up who you are? Because if you just are a physical self, you put yourself on the ground. I mean, yep. Let's say you're in a coma. Mm -hmm. You're just being fed intravenously. You're getting all your nutrients. Your body can keep going just by doing that. But what makes you you to even... Why do you go to like the Korean area in New York and you find just... You go to like a Japanese restaurant and... 90% of the people in there are Japanese. You go to Mexican Well, yeah, that's, that's funny because where I work is a <laughs> Japanese place with mostly Chinese people. Okay. So. <laughs> so, I mean, well, but it's Asian. We always, we always laugh so, about that. So yeah. why do you see like certain foods develop in certain areas? Do those foods have something to do with the mentality of the people? And I think there well, is a connection to that. Well, I was going to say, yes. Like, for example, with sushi, the original development, or I guess the way that developed, I don't know, I don't know I'm not wording that well, but um, was that... Japan itself, you know, it's an a series of islands. It doesn't have a lot of natural resources. So they just had to catch whatever fish were around. But the idea was they ate it raw because they knew it would go bad. So it's you kill the fish, eat it right away. The restaurants in Japan, and I think there might even be some in the city, where they pull the fish out of the tank, kill it right there, and eat it. Yeah. And the idea is that, okay, it doesn't have a chance to grow bacteria or anything. And uh, wasabi, one of the reasons they ate it with that was they believed it killed the parasite. I don't know if it actually does. I haven't looked into the science behind that, but that's, that's one of the beliefs they had. But that, like, that's how sushi was. But then 
out of Asian countries, I learned only Japan really has sushi. Koreans do a little bit, but like that's pretty much it. Like the Chinese mm -hmm. don't do it or so on. But then like I loved learning about Chinese cuisines. Like for example, um, my chef in CIA, Chef Chang, is one of my favorites. Um, she was from Sichuan or Sichuan, whichever you want to call it. Um, that's closer to the Middle East, so you see it's spicier, sesame seeds, there's a lot of that stuff. But then if you go closer to the East, it's more seafood, obviously. Um, in the South, it's more, um, it's more rice, whereas the North is more wheat because it's colder. Um, of course, in the North, they say that's where the higher-end Chinese food comes from because that's where the emperor lived and yeah. all that. Um, you see they have, like, the Mongolian barbecue, obviously. China and Mongolia are separate countries, but there's that Mongolian influence because they ruled China and so on. So it's like it had to do with the regions and who developed based on what. Um, as an aside, I mean, I'm actually multi-European background. I'm Austrian, Polish, German, Italian, English, and French. You know, I'm a Euro mutt. So I looked into a lot of, I've looked into a lot of those different foods, like how they developed. And uh, one thing I found very interesting is that Polish food... Um, it's very, it's very like rustic, very peasant mm -hmm. food oriented. But the reason behind that is that historically, their leaders were just monarch, were their monarchs were just peasants who seized power basically. Yeah. Whereas in France, they had the whole divine right and so on. So the idea was, oh, we have to make the best food we can for our king. And over time, it got better and better because of that. I mean, Polish food is good, but it's more stuffed cabbage, pierogies, yeah. and all that. And it's more rustic because it was just what those people ate growing up. And then when they seized power, okay, cook this for me. Whereas in France, there was that drive towards development because it's like, we have to please our divine ruler. Oh. And this is an interesting thing about what I'm trying to get at is that you can learn so much by just learning more about any particular field. Yeah. Like right now, if you go into the history of food, you can understand why did these foods develop yeah. there. Like, I lived in Italy for a while, and of course, I've lived in Kenya. And they, in Kenya, there's different tribes. So there's different tribes, there's certain yeah. tribes where it's associated with certain food. Like, from the tribe that I'm from, the Luya tribe, chicken is typically something that is associated with right. that tribe. Like, let's say the Luya is really like cocoa, which is yeah. chicken in Swahili. But it's also by Lake Victoria, which is a big source of tilapia. So that's also in part of the cuisine. Right. Now in Kenya, there's also an influence of Indian cuisine because it was um, it was colonized by the British, and the British brought some Indians. A lot of indentured to, servants, right? Yeah, yeah. to uh, build, to help, yeah. uh, to help just run this run yeah. the, the country. So some of them stayed there. The food has mixed in, and since it wasn't that deep of a history of actual cuisine there, like you have in some in some of the in some of the Oriental areas in Asia, you have this in some of the European countries. I don't know how strong of a culinary tradition there is in the Middle East, but as you mentioned, even in Europe, now, <laughs> Europe is a very diverse place, even yeah. though it's the white people, but as you said, <laughs> with Poland, it, it doesn't have that strong of cuisine. I remember being in Italy. It's good, but it's rustic. Yes. It's rustic. It's not. You don't have swoosh of puree on the plate yeah. and canal of ice cream and all that. Yeah. I remember also in Italy, it seemed to be very... But then that also very depends on the region. Yes, yeah. it 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 was also it had very down to earth things. They had some aspects where they had actual not protect. They had some protect protectionist uh, policies with the government, where it's this particular region is the only region you can get this kind of salumi from, this kind of ham, and then the reason that ham only comes from there is because those pigs go up and they eat this special kind of bush that's on this that only that grows area. on this one hill and it gets infused into yeah. the meat. And it comes out, and there's some pride and some aspect to that. Where now those people who are have been eating that food, whoever has been healthy enough eating that food for that long enough time, will have, will get more out of that food versus somebody else. It's a similar thing. Like food in and of itself is just food. It's mm -hmm. just a mix of protein, chemicals, or whatever yeah. put together. That material comes to you in one way, and then what you do with it, what your body does with it, is affected by many. But many different things. Well, you're, so I, was thinking, I was just thinking in my own head, like, it's sort of the same thing with music. Like, a person who's not that into music could say, okay, I just hear different notes, different instruments, they're just, you know. But then a person who has a background in it or whatever can say, okay, I appreciate the melody, I appreciate, I hear the orchestra and I hear the winds here, I hear the, the strings here, I hear, you know, the bassoon here. But it's like, depending on your training, depending on your passion, all that, you can pick that stuff out. And it's the same thing with food. Like, you know, a number of people in my family will say, oh, I won't spend a lot on food because to me it's just fuel to get through the day. And mm -hmm. they can afford a nice meal, but they're like, why would I spend the money? Yeah. Whereas with me, I appreciate it and so on. Or like I have a friend who's big on cars and with him it's the same thing. Like 
you know, if, even if I were a multimillionaire, I wouldn't be able to tell you the nicest cars from like, I mean, I could tell you, okay, a Ferrari is a nice car, whatever, but I couldn't tell you what statistics it has that separates it from, yeah. you know, I wouldn't be able to, you know, so, you know, again, it's like, this is the whole subjective value thing that's, you know, yeah. Austrian economics. You know? <laughs> now, when it goes on, I'm talking, yeah, that's, a, that's a good point to yeah. say where you can tell different things. Like, yeah. for example, I just like experimenting in the kitchen. Um, what's like the TV came on? You just, let's go over and turn that off yeah, for a yeah. second. So yeah. we were talking about like, you know, I mean, I guess a lot of that you could go into like upbringing, how you were raised, etc., and so on. Like, um, you know, growing up, my dad always was always big on not spending much on food. But then you look at his parents; they grew up during the depression. They ate what they had to, and that was it. And then when I got my dad into some of this higher end stuff, he began to appreciate it. But that's because he didn't know it existed. He didn't know the whole world behind it and so on. And for me, it's like. If I had a lot of money and I had the money to spend in a nice car, like I'd probably learn more about that and I think I would actually appreciate it more. But right now to me it's just, okay, it's a piece of metal to get me from point A to point B, but that's because I don't know enough and I wouldn't appreciate enough to, you know. Yeah. Okay, so let's think about this food IQ thing and the way it affects people. Yeah. Okay, as I said, food is just food. Yeah. Like a peanut is just a peanut. Yeah. For most people, they take it in, they get a good amount of protein from it and they're well and good. Yep. There's a small percentage of the people who will take that same exact peanut and it'll kill them dead. Yeah. You know, yeah. They'll have a physical reaction yeah. to it. Now, I imagine this happens two different levels across all foods. That's why I was thinking the ancestral diet. If you can find out, if you can, now they have the 21 and Me kind yeah. of things where you can find the genetics. Yeah. I can imagine they'll have a kind of thing where they can be like, they can find the genetics, you find that location, and they make a map the exact foods that were endemic or yeah. grew in that area. And... Well, well, I was going to say, like, with Asians and, like, lactose intolerant, like, I was looking this up, how, like, if you look up lactose intolerant, like, a substantial portion of the Asian population, this is throughout China, Japan, whatever, you know, those countries, are lactose intolerant, but that's because historically they didn't eat much dairy. Yeah. But if you look at the rates where they're the lowest, it's Northern Europeans, and you think about it, that makes sense, because they yeah. had cheese, milk, and whatever, but because... You know, and that also gets into, okay, the raw milk thing, pasteurization, does that kill the enzymes and so on. But historically speaking, those countries had a lot of cheese, had a lot of milk and so on. So they got used to it over time. Whereas yeah. countries, people that their ancestors didn't eat it that much, it's alien to their system. Yeah. And now, also on top of that, you have to think of the kind of bodies back then. Yeah. We talked about how even just cooking itself. Yeah. Not even too long ago, cooking used to be a 40-hour week. Yeah. I found this story. It said it was a 40-hour week job. And in most places in the world, it still is that way. Because I know you live in, in cities, you get to just, you can just run in anywhere and get foods from all over the world, and you don't really understand the process that goes through that. And like one point, I was saying I like to cook, but there's certain foods that are very labor intensive that you yeah. can't really get away from. It. Things like lasagna, I'm more than willing to pay for lasagna because you understand the well, process that goes into well, making a typical lasagna, all the ingredients. I, I don't know if you saw that picture I posted earlier, but I had dinner at Bar Balloon tonight where I used to work actually, and I posted a picture of a uh, duck pate en croute. We'll have and, links in the low bar for that one. And the, uh, and with that, it's like you have to cook the meat, but it's also cooked inside dough, so you have to time that right. So you cook the meat, wrap it in the dough, bake it with the dough on the outside, and so on. So there's a whole timing behind it. And the thing with charcuterie that's interesting is that um, charcuterie, for those that don't know, it's pates, terrines, etc., and What's interesting about that is it's actually a very low cost item as far as the ingredients, but the labor is intensive because you have to know, okay, I heated up this much, it's cooked to this level, but then there's variables there too. Like for example, at that place, they have a uh, rabbit terrine, but the rabbit terrine has carrots in it. But if the carrots have more water than they did the last time and you cook them, that'll throw off the recipe. Yeah. So it's like you try to get it at a certain level, but then there are variables that can screw you up too. So when you buy that stuff, you're mostly paying for the labor. It's mostly... The ingredients themselves are cheap, but there's that real finesse in getting it to come out that exact right way. Yeah. It's like getting the gelatin is set, there's carrots, you gotta braise the meat, you gotta make sure that there's not too much water in the carrots, because then they'll bleed out and the pate will fall apart, you know, all that stuff. And then like the one I had earlier, it was like there's foie gras in the middle and you have to like work quickly so it doesn't oxidize, you have to cook the duck, but then you have to bake it in the dough and you need the dough to turn brown, but at the same time you don't want the stuff inside to overcook either and all that, you know. So it's like it's getting all those points exactly right now. Yeah. yeah, and you can think of just the <laughs> this all you explaining there. Yeah, the amount of effort and labor that goes into yeah. doing this, and think about how it was in the past for somebody to have developed that meal, that yeah. dish, 
and to get all the ingredients together to have that dish. Yet now you can easily just go somewhere and get that dish. Yeah. That just a hundred years ago, used to take used to be a one in hundred thousand meal that people yeah. would actually have access to. Right? Yeah. The top tip top percent of the people would actually get that. Or you'd have it once in your life ever. You'd save up for a long time for it. So now that you have a situation where people just have access to food and they can just gorge on calorie dense yeah. foods because of a very positive reason. Because in the past, if you weren't attracted to these calorie dense foods, you don't know when the next time you're going to come across it too is. You might get too weak to hand to. To obtain it the next time because a lot of these foods were calorie dense because it actually took some effort to actually find that food yeah now how does that apply to actual information because in the past you used to live in an area physically have to select you physically had to ex like ex exert yourself to get obtain this food this physical nutrition for your body right and it was selected you didn't have this abundant access to it it wasn't just readily available you can just sit back and just take more and more yeah so has a similar thing happened with information if i think you do agree that information does make you who you are what you read what you learn how you were brought up to, yes yeah. that helps you who you are like yeah you talked about your parents and it's a similar thing i told my mom was when we were growing up the snacks that she had at the house weren't candy bars yeah. and things like that it was like cassava's and sweet potatoes because that's what she grew up with and that's also what she gave us and yeah. that helped me be nutritional but once I got out of the house of course I yeah. kind of went to my well, own you know, you know what's funny with me when I was little I wanted all those sugary cereals and as an adult they don't appeal to me because I'm just like this is like yeah. poison in a bowl like it tastes great but I'm like I know it's straight sugar and like white flour yeah. you know? it has come back to that Dye. I occasionally go back and I've been doing some ketogenic cycles but <laughs> some yeah. soda on the side here I'm kind of <laughs> treating myself occasionally hey, got it, but you, know. you don't have to and that's the thing you don't have to you can be very selective about these things I've had the experience of now getting on diets getting on a ketogenic cycle then I go off of it and you can feel the changes in your body as we discussed with lactose intolerance right. that's something that is actually across the board you might be not as violently lactose intolerant as some people but milk is not supposed to be something that grown adults drink I mean, I think human beings are pretty much the only creatures that drink grown adult, grown milk, I mean, drink milk, milk as adults. From, yeah. And not even human milk. No, we drink, no. I mean, milk is for baby cows, people. Milk is for baby cows. Yeah. It should be only drank by baby cows, but people still drink it. And there's actually, I mean, when you try taking, being selective in what you eat, I know that there's people make fun of the organic movement, the whole food movement, yeah. but there is there is actually some positives behind it. Yeah, definitely, that. for sure, yeah. Yeah. But now with the foods that you eat, you can tell the difference when you're eating junk food versus when you're eating more healthy nutritional food. Right. Now, how do you think that applies to actual information? What is junk information and what is nutritional organic information well the issue too is um I, there was a very good article I actually sent to my aunt she's a nutritionist by the way she has a master's in it um it was talking about the sugar industry and how corrupt it is and how much they've lobbied to like silence bad stuff about sugar i mean obviously we know about tooth decay and stuff but apparently excessive sugar is also bad for heart health and the thing is all this time they blamed a lot on I, we can provide a link to that whatever it's from uh fee the think tank freedom what is it Foundation of Economic Education this is one of my favorite uh, think tanks um, and they talk about this how there was all this lobbying and so on and they tried to pin it all on you know eating beef and so on which obviously too much is bad for you but they downplayed sugar's role in causing heart problems mm -hmm. because they wanted people to buy their products and it's also the whole thing with the corn industry lobbying to put high tariffs on foreign sugar that way foreign sugar is more expensive so people use corn syrup and stuff, but now corn syrup, especially high fructose corn syrup, it's higher on the glycemic index, so it sends your blood sugar, you know, into the stratosphere. But the thing is, they want to shut out that cheaper cane sugar from other countries because they want people to use the high fructose corn syrup. Yeah. But the high fructose corn syrup's only been big since like the 70s or so. Before that, most people used cane sugar. And you see they're working around a little now, like there's like beet sugar and stuff. But if you go to a lot of other countries, they say that... um soda sweetened with cane sugar which is actually not as bad for you and it tastes better too in my opinion but high fructose corn syrup it's just like you drink that all the time you're gonna blow up like it's you know it's one of the worst things for you i mean just think about so it's, it's it's basically the special interest trying to control things because they want people to buy their products yeah. in short yeah 
And I'm thinking with something like high fructose corn syrup, it could have just been from the lobby for just corn when people used to yeah. eat more corn in general. Then the markets got to a point where there was just all this excess corn. And then you know you have this excess you got corn. Ethanol, so now you got ethanol. What are you going to do with corn, corn? syrup? Then yeah. you find out, hey, we can make syrup out of yeah. this. And then now you replace that. So it's strange how certain information funnels you down a certain route. And yeah. then there's... There's certain effects that kind of branch off from that happening. Yeah. So, hmm. well, it's interesting too because if you read about prohibition, like even before the twenties, like when they tried to push for it in the late nineteenth century, you see all the stuff they were conjuring about alcohol, like you know, oh, alcohol is going to make you hallucinate, all this stuff, and so on. And that movement was originally fundamentally religious, but then it became like, oh, as a way, and then it became um, law, and of course, we saw it led to organized crime and so on. And for those who may or may not know the history of marijuana becoming illegal, it's the same thing. They wanted to crack down on Mexicans who smoked it as part of their culture. Yeah. So they had to come up with all this stuff about like, oh, it's going to make you do this, it's going to do that, whatever. When in reality, far more people die from alcohol than marijuana, for example. So, but it's like, they, you know, there's that certain interest group that controls it. So they demonize it, but people just go by. Not, not everyone, obviously, but a lot of people hear that and are like, okay, I better stay away. But then it's like... Okay, how many people die each year from alcohol? You know, it's crazy, you know, drunk driving, overdose, whatever. But then how many people die from marijuana? It never happens. Yeah. You know? Okay, so, again... <laughs> I know, I know that's a little bit of a... No, know, no, no, no. I was no, trying no. to make I think I think it's good to... Uh, yeah. We're jumping around to different topics. That's the same thing happened in the last talk. Just touching yeah, sure. different things. But now with... You see, the prohibition with the controls of what you eat, where you eat it from... Yeah. We have people going to public schools in America. In just the world in general, there's a lot of public schooling. Um, I think in the developed countries, now you have a situation where you have, as I said before, you have increased access to pretty much all sorts of foods yeah. that you can ever have. Like even in places like Italy, they still have um, seasonal foods, yet you come to somewhere, Whole Foods seems to have every food you want at all times. Yeah. Now they added the aspect where they're going to, Amazon just bought it, so now this food delivery has already started where food can be delivered directly to you. Now they have companies that, if you want to have the cooking process, they'll deliver to you all the ingredients with a recipe. Right. So why is it in a situation where you have, where you have access to all this food, why do people make, still make such bad decisions on their nutrition, the physical nutrition, and also in a situation where you have access to all this information on the internet, why do people also make negative decisions on the information they take in that way? Well, I think with the fast food, it's just convenience. It's that it's very low cost. You know, you can, you can produce McDonald's. It's like, you know, they always talk about how much of it's actually beef anymore and so on. But, you know, you can get a meal for like under 10 bucks, whereas like, okay, a whole meal, you know, at a sit down restaurant, that's going to be... 30 40 bucks plus depending where you go and that's probably on the lighter side mm -hmm. but um it's also the timing of it like oh i want to go into a place have food for me grab it get out go back to work um it's the whole you know eat to live versus live to eat thing like i was describing some of my family members earlier it's more eat to live like oh you need food to get through the day i appreciate good food but i don't need it whereas other people it's like for me like you know anyone who follows me on instagram facebook whatever it's like i'm always posting pictures of food and stuff because it's like I appreciate the artwork behind it, I appreciate the stories behind it, and so on. Like, you know, to a person who doesn't know as much about art, for example, like obviously, you know, you draw a lot and stuff, um, to them, oh, it's a nice painting, but that's it. But then someone who's more, who knows more about it might say, wow, look at these details, and so yeah. on. So th I think there's that, too. Um, again, I think it's laziness, I think it's convenience, um, I think it's... People don't really prioritize their time. It's like, it's not that they can't cook wholesome foods, it's that they don't want to take the time to do it, you know. It's like, oh, I want to throw something in the microwave and watch TV for a few hours, and that's easier than actually, like, working for a little bit in the kitchen, you know. Um, I think, that, yeah, I think those are some things just I've kind of witnessed, but... Okay, with with that mentioned, I also have, as I said, I, I thought about that before, and I was kind of thinking, you know, they say these days that women don't cook anymore, and there's this kind of trope that women in the West don't cook yeah. anymore. But it's... And then, of course, people would say, but men don't do it either, but it typically hasn't been yeah. something men did. But anyway. Uh, my grandfather, <laughs> but also only, top knows, chefs my grandfather only knows how to make coffee. That's okay. it. That's all he knows how to do. <laughs> but also the top chefs in the world, mostly male, so men are better at everything. 
all you women out there Ooh, listening. Boy. Yes. <laughs> Leave your comments below. If you can name me, just yeah, just look at the top chefs in the world. Anyway, you know, getting you, back I mean, to the that. April Bloomfield, uh, Kat Cora. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> getting back to the point, what, what kind of case could you make for people to actually do that? Because for me, I'm thinking the well, purpose of food is to get the nutrition. So when it really comes down to it, if you could get to a point where there's just an IV where you could just take like a pill yeah. and that could have everything, that would be it. What would the argument you'd make for somebody who's like, look, I don't know how to cook. I used to make fun of people and be like, look, there's people who could probably starve with a pantry full of food because they don't know how to boil the rice or they don't know how to do this. Yeah. But what is the actual case? I was trying to think, what case would I make to somebody who is in their 30s, has never cooked, lives in the city, is making seventy five thousand a year, has has a, has a, has a partner, has a career. Yeah. I mean, ostensibly is successful at life, yet cannot obtain actual physical food and prepare it to a point where they can ingest it. But they have created a situation where, besides that, they've been able to obtain the resources to pay somebody else to do all that for them. So what's the argument to get that person to actually learn how to cook? And I think the reason I'm asking this is because going back to the whole of saying humans are more than just what they eat, I feel if you can kind of understand this, there might be a, little, a way to understand that and say, look, I do understand you can just order all your food every day, but knowing how to cook itself might be important, even if you don't do it, just how, instead of just listening to source of information, some news channel telling you this is what's happening in the world it's also good for you to know the process behind the how that information is acquired being able to understand like you said when you look at that pate for me i just looked at it i was like wow that looks really cool with the layers but yeah. you look at it and you understand the here's process slog, that right, here's, this and, here's cherries yeah. here's the dough yeah so that knowledge of having there where you can tell like look you saw this food, you hear this information, and you can be like, okay, this new story was put together this way, this doesn't seem right. What is the case you would make to convince somebody or just make the case for people to learn how to cook even if they don't do it on a daily basis? See, that's the thing. is like you said, with your person earning high income who has a, you know, a spouse who also does, it's like you don't really need to learn how. I mean, it's sort of like, like I can't do artwork to save my life. Like I can't draw or whatever. And... I had a debate with a friend recently who made the case that we need art, humanity needs art, and so on. And you can make that case as well, but at the same time, not everyone needs to know how to draw. Like, it's a nice skill to have, but do you really need it? And yeah. then, and then it, I think that just gets into, okay, your own preferences, and it's like, you know, if you want to draw because you think it's fun, sure. If you want to make money, great. Um, if you can make money, you know, fantastic. But it's like, does everyone have to be able to do that, or can everyone do that? I don't know. It's like... Does every can everyone be a Thomas Keller? No, likely not. I mean, most people don't have that drive or that dedication. Not, I mean, not just. Not to me, it's not. It's not just raw a matter of raw talent. It's like, do they have the passion to want to work? Like, you know, I mean, Keller worked for free in these French three Michelin star restaurants. He did eighteen hour days, things yeah. like that. And the thing is, and he worked for free, but he just wanted to learn it that much. And obviously, it's paid off. I mean, he's considered the best chef in America, and he has these great places. But the thing is. Do most people have the drive to reach that level? No, I don't think so. But then does everyone have to as well either? Like, I don't know if you heard that um, that recent conversation with Bill Whittle talking about how it was his dream to be a jet fighter pilot, but mm -hmm. he actually had a vision problem. I mean, I don't, I don't know what it is exactly. Like, he can see okay, but, like, he needs contacts or whatever. But to be a jet fighter pilot, you have to have that, like, perfect eyesight. But then... He has a small biplane he flies on his own for fun, which can yeah. go like a few hundred miles an hour, but it's not a jet fighter. But he said, in his own mind, that's good enough because he's working to the best of his abilities. So he had to develop himself in other areas, but he's doing something the best he can at the level he can. And he's like, look, I won't be a jet fighter pilot, but that's okay. I've accepted that's my limit. And you, you could come, he even made the point too, like, you know, how many people want to be NBA players? Many, but it's yeah. like, there's only room for so many. But it doesn't mean you can't play among friends and still be good. It just means you'll, you won't be at that top level. But that doesn't mean you can't be at the top level in something else, just not that. But I think that's the point that yeah. we're trying to make. So we're talking about what is the base level of knowledge of food IQ? Because I think we can both admit that yeah. thinking 
chocolate milk comes from brown cows is not is not a good level. It's not an appropriate brown level. Brown eggs come from of, brown chickens. Oh, yeah, of, white eggs come from white chickens. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a yeah. bit low on the food IQ yeah. level. So, I'm thinking if you have a higher food IQ, what's the level of knowledge of food itself, of the process, of what you ingest, that could probably do something about, for example, the obesity problem? Well, I, I think they, people need to be calorie conscious for one. Like, I'm not always good on that. It's, if you see my meal from earlier, you can tell. Um, but for me, but at the same time, I don't eat like that every day either. Um, I think also in the past, you had these farmers who ate these huge meals, but they also had jobs where they worked in the field 12 or more hours a day, yeah. so they burn it all off. If you eat like that now and you're sitting in an office for eight or more hours, you go home and watch TV, obviously that's going to add up, you know. So, um, you know, I think it's overall understanding those, uh, the nutrients, the whole... I know like some professional bodybuilders and figure models will actually count their calories exactly. I'm not saying everyone should do that. I don't do that either. But it's like at that level, if you're competitive, it's like you really have to be aware. Yeah. But I think I think people should at least be more aware of like, okay, you know, you're having soda with high fructose corn syrup, a lot of sugar, a lot of very concentrated sugar. You drink that all the time. You're going to blow up, you know. Yeah, you see, that's, that's the point. If you, of course, if somebody's paying you a contract, paying you millions... Yeah. To, to be in certain yeah. shape, you can do it. Like you see a lot of Hollywood actors, they have these body transformations yeah. for a film. In a few months, they gain 50 pounds or drop 50 pounds. But they're also being paid a lot, and that's also a select group. But I'm trying to figure out the general, because I really do think if you focus on any certain aspect, and food is something that we all still yeah. need to eat. So it could be an interesting way to understand why... There's certain, there's certain topics and certain social issues that... Stem around food, I think part of it, you see this in public schools. They say, okay, public schools are a good place now because there's school lunch, people go in there. Right now in New York, there's this funding being talked, they're talking about rolling back some funding to the city. And then, of course, the first thing they go to is the Meals on Wheels program, which is something where, um, where like the elderly and yeah, the are just able that, yeah, like, the food is delivered to their homes. Them, yeah. So, no, of course, the the fight for 15, there's the minimum wage jobs, and a lot of the minimum wage jobs are in the food industry, in the lower food industry, yeah. in the fast food type industry. And these people are trying to get it up to $15, which, as you said, the, most of the reason you're paying for at restaurants, because sometimes you'll find deals, like you just went to Popeye's and there's like a $5 deal and you get like a yeah. biscuit, three tenders, three tendies, yeah. and, and some fries. And the amount of calories you're getting for some of these meals, I think... I saw an article that said even just a double cheeseburger was one of the cheapest and ca calorie dense food. Like yeah. per what you pay per calorie is one of the best foods in the world. So technically, if you even just ate that, but you just didn't have twenty of them, you'd still be getting your food. So I'm just saying. But then the issue is, what other nutrients would you be missing out yes. on? You wouldn't be getting vitamin C. Yeah. You know, you'd be getting protein, obviously, but. Um, you know, then it's also what type of bun is it? Is it whole grain versus white bread? There's yeah. that. Um, then, of course, with you, with the keto diet, okay, you cut out the carbs. So, you know, that opens up other questions as well. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, of course, vitamin mineral deficiency. But, you know, as my dad taught me at a young age, it's like you can't have too many minerals. You have a lot of iron. You're going to get sick and it's going to poison you. Um, but you need some, obviously. You know, it's like it's monitoring all that. Or even like the water soluble versus fat soluble vitamins. Like mm -hmm. vitamin C is water soluble. You can have a ton of it. It's like you would have to have like a few thousand percent a day for it to kill you. But then with something like vitamin D that's fat soluble, it dissolves in fat, not water. So because of that, it's easier to overdose on that because your body absorbs it more slowly and so on. Yeah. And there was, there was one vitamin somebody told me about, like, you take it once a year and it stays in your system. Was it vitamin B or B12 or something? No, uh, let's ignore that because I... I, I was going to say a lot of people have B12 now with all the There's supplements and so on. something that stays in your system for longer. But, okay, so with the food issues, I think these are key things that people pull yeah. on. And they can, they can be used for political ends because I think we all still understand that food is, is food. We need food to survive. It's... It's, it's what you are. You are yeah. what you eat. Yeah. So if you prevent people from having access to food, they aren't anymore. They won't be anymore. Yeah. If you don't eat long enough, you won't be anymore. If you eat unhealthily, you won't be anymore. Yeah. So it's something important. Now, I think the fact that they can use that for political ends and get to the point where 
if you're being tied into this and then now you're getting your mental ideas, you're getting junk ideas, and then you cease, I think you cease to be, you cease to be the human that you can be yeah. if you're also not getting yeah. healthy ideas. So this is why I'm trying to understand how, how do you think it would, to make the case, not just for food, for better nutrition of the things you put in your mouth, but for get better nutrition for the things you put in your head so you can release better things out of your mouth. What what do you think the process is could could be done to to encourage this? Well, you're talking about like philosophy in general and um Yes, yeah, just to have a this more info IQ. If there's food IQ to just have more info IQ, I guess. I don't know the term we're gonna use here. I mean I'm trying to think of how to reduce this to a few sentences. Doesn't have to be you, sentences. Well, because like, <laughs> well, because, because like with philosophy, it's like, that's why it's important because like you said earlier, there's all this information out there. How do you know which is right? You have to look at, okay, what's the source? What is the bias of it? And at the same time, a bias source can still be right. It just means it's going to be more favored in one direction. Like a lot of people will dismiss something because they don't like the source, but that doesn't mean that source is inherently lying all the time either. Yeah. It's just, oh, I don't like what it says because it goes against my ideology. And, you know, so you have to look at multiple sources, compare information, see which ones are, you know, who would have a, who would have a conflict of interest versus who wouldn't. Like, for example, um, you know, the FDA has been sloppy with reviewing drugs, for example, but then there's a nonprofit group called Best Pills, Worst Pills. I, I actually wrote a blog, I talk about this and that, and I th I'm trying to think if there were like six different drugs or something the FDA predicted that were okay, but Best Pills, Worst Pills said, no, we're going to recall, they're going to be recalled, they're not good, and they ended up being right. But with the FDA, you have issues with bribery. If, like, the head of Monsanto runs the FDA, he's going to let Monsanto's stuff slip through, etc. Mm -hmm. But then with this group, it's just a non-profit group that's just dedicated to figuring anything, to figuring this out. And it's like, unless there's evidence that they've been bribed, it's like they're likely going to be objective because they were founded for this mission, you know? But then, but then even there, there's conflict, too. Like, our friend... Um, there's a documentary Cowspiracy talking about the meat industry and all like, you know, how poorly the animals are treated, all that, the pollution too. And she said with that, Greenpeace was actually paid hush money to keep quiet yeah. about it. So then it just, it becomes more complicated, you know, and it's like, I don't know, it's tough. I mean, you know, you try to do the best you can, but then you find out different groups are bought off or whatever. Or a friend of mine posted something uh, today talking about how there was a certain, um, a certain senator who pushed for more gun control but then he was lobbied he was paid by a law firm that in the past has lobbied for more gun control mm -hmm. so naturally obviously there's a conflict of interest there because they're going to say to him hey you better do this or next time you run we're not going to fund you so then there's that too you know and i don't think people understand how tied in these things are no because no, no. the food you eat like you eat certain foods you're yeah. going to be more sluggish then you're more sluggish and you know they say okay they the cost efficiency they say okay you go to the fast food place it's like i said the five dollar box you get that yeah. or you get like some deal on mcdonald's and you get two chickens or whatever for a certain price and they think okay i've got my, these calories now and it's a lot cheaper than going to the store and getting some chicken yeah. cutlets and learning and spending the time to cook it yeah. but in the long run the health effects of that has the mental effects how yeah. you're not thinking as as well then in the future you have to pay more healthcare costs. You might have heart issues yeah. or something, yeah. Oh. And also the tide the tied in aspect of this. The same institutions I think that are responsible for that are responsible for providing and creating the kind of society where you have this cheap access or this I don't have to say cheap, but since as we're discussing readily available. In the, yeah, readily yeah. available is oh. better because in the long run it's actually more expensive yeah. to do, to eat this way. Yeah. But readily available access to these to this in this kind of food is also the same system that has engendered a situation where people have access to information, a lot of information, but also a lot of low quality information and people still take that in. Because I think the same drive that we have of, you see something that's calorie dense, you have that urge, let me go consume that food. Yeah. Is the same thing as, oh, there's information, there's this pretty looking person or there's this explosion or yeah. there's this, fight and you're attracted to take that information in it's the same way i think people are attracted to i want to say lowbrow entertainment but just, it's sensationalism yes. i think that's what it is yeah 
So if we're saying it's a positive thing, I mean, because I don't necessarily think it's inherently a negative thing to have readily available access to these things. Now it's how do you get it to be people to make better decisions on on what they partake in. I mean, I think it just comes down to education, like learning philosophy, so you know which news sources are reputable versus which ones have an agenda. Learning nutrition, which they kind of do, but like you brought up earlier, the uh, food pyramid, you know, of course there's issues with that now. And I know even, even within the field of nutrition itself, like I've always been interested in nutrition, I'm not an expert by any means, but um, I know like, for example, in the 80s, they went back and forth, are eggs good, are eggs bad, and it was like... You know, the cholesterol is bad for you. Oh, no, they're great for you. Oh, no, yeah. it's bad for you. Now, eggs are considered one of the perfect foods because, like, the protein is 100% used by your body. Whereas with beef, it's like, I think it's like 30, 40%. Like, a lot of it just goes through your body. Whereas with eggs, it's fully absorbed. So, things like that, you know. And then even if you, the people are doing a good job at it and listing all the material, I think they said something like the amount that it costs to... There was a restaurant that had to write its nutritional... The nutritional facts of the foods that it had and if they were doing it they'd have to print up like a 20 page yeah and who's gonna it. read that yeah, yeah. who's gonna read yeah. all how often do you guys read stuff i mean <laughs> i do when i'm doing the diets i'll read through and get the the amount of carbs and things like that but most people don't do this that like i don't think i've read any book i don't think i've bought any books on nutrition i read a lot obviously but i don't i don't like i don't think i ever went out and bought a book on like this diet or whatever i've just read articles here and there and kind of like pieced together in my own mind yeah, yeah. I haven't sat there and read like, okay, the book for the best diet, you know, here's why, you know. And even when they do that, if they say it's like based off a 2,200 calorie diet, that was based off of an average, probably Caucasian male, that's white privilege right there. <laughs> uh, but it was probably done off of that. So now, is that the same nutritional material well, they're using when you go to Japan, when you see that? Is that the same thing, uh, five foot tall... A hundred pound w woman from her Sri Lanka should be reading that and say like, yeah, this is what I should be eating. Is that the same calories for a six foot five, three hundred pound person from the Sudan? Like, well, so even, even within the human species itself, like I read some stuff. I think it was from National Geographic about uh, the Neanderthals, and they were saying they think they ate like a thirty five hundred a day calorie diet. Yeah. Or something. But then you think about how big they were, how active they were, so it made sense. And getting back to what I was saying earlier with the farmers about how. Um, you know, a farmer eats all these eggs, eats a steak for breakfast, but then he works in the field 14 yeah. hours, so he burns that all at all. But if you eat that and you sit in front of a desk every day, it's like, is that good for you? Well, I don't think you can make the case that it is. And, and, then, and then if you exercise outside of there, okay, that's good, that balances it out. But if you just work in your office all day and then go home and just sit in front of a TV and then fall asleep, it's like, well, that's going to add up over time. Yeah. And it also goes back to the base information. Like I was saying, this is... These nutritional facts are big based off of that 200, I mean, let's say it was like a 5'9 five, five, person who yeah. weighs 170 like my, like my, pounds. Well, I, I now, is that even the average person anymore? You know, like, for for example, the, this is, I don't know if I can Height find Height-wise, I mean, I'm 5'9, I'm that's about average height, um, but that's also in the West. I know, like, North and South yeah. Koreans have a difference because... The North Koreans are starved, so their height is actually lower and things like that. Yeah, and even speaking about that, uh, at least here in New York, you see a lot of really tall Asian people. Yeah. It freaks me out a bit. Like you A lot of the Koreans I work with are my height or taller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you, you see that, and it's actually been proven that the diet has been more westernized in Japan, and the average height of the Japanese is changing. It's like, so, it like grew by like six inches in the decades after World yeah. War II or something. Yeah, it's crazy. So how often do they change this? How often are these actual so even if you're being very diligent and you're it, saying it, that look i'm actually following calories i'm following what the government is telling you for whoever is telling you and you're following what's written on the back yeah. you're reading that stuff but if you're not applying it to yourself it could actually change because it's about the content of the information not just the information itself the well, information, exactly in the itself, information yeah, yeah. is just there but then what is that information based on is that information still valid to you in your personal situation yeah. like uh you know, again, depending on your profession, like if you sit in front of a desk all day, I don't even know that 2,000 calories a day is good. It might not yeah. be based on your... But if you, if you know, obviously if you're a professional athlete, like I've seen how some of these NBA players eat, but then it's like you're practicing every day for hours on end, then yeah. you have your game and so on. So that makes sense. Yeah. And they've probably been doing this. Some of these people have been doing this, like with the Neanderthals, at least we're talking yeah. about the in prehistory. They were constantly on the move. Those hunter gatherers were keeping it up, so they never had Fighting a point off other where humans. Yeah, 
And you can also change your metabolism. Like I was extremely overweight before, and then you got to a point where you started dieting and getting back into there. It changes your mental state, it changes your physical state. Like somebody weighing 300 pounds, if it's 250 pounds of muscle, it's going to be a whole different thing. So even in the past, even if you had somebody back then and they were 200 pounds, you'd get an average 200 person, pound person here. The 200 pound person in the present might have a 20, 25% body fat. In that past, that person, that Neanderthal probably had like a 10% body fat and had never had a point. The where, muscle mass was Yes, the crazy, muscle yeah. mass was different. Yeah. Their probiotics, the probiotics, the internal, internal bacteria, was, their gut bacteria was different. Yeah, what is it? What is so it? There's they never prebiotics had a and prebiotics and there's probiotics. Yeah. Like probiotics help digestion and prebiotics help probiotics work. Yeah. You know? So, and you know, they've talked about that too, like pollution and processed food, like a lot of that stuff gets killed off or we don't have as much of it as we should. Yeah, and you see, as not, not have as much of it as we should because it gets to a point where you can actually drop by the dietary conditions you have. You go to school or you just have yeah. a couple of years eating horribly, but you can reset that. Now in the past, they they never had that reset. No. They never needed to reset. Their metabolism was driving, chugging on a whole different level. Yeah. So even when you go with something like the paleo, paleo diet, you might be like, okay, I'm doing it for that. But you got to realize with that paleo diet, it was from an entirely different time. Yeah. To entirely different, not entirely different, but their physiology, the people who were intaking that were completely different human beings. Yeah. So, yeah. Um... I just released something about, okay, was about, I just talked about how the, the school system, the education system, and talking about how the different human beings, different things were set for different times. As we discussed, yeah. the calories were set on an average male yeah. in the past with different information. This how information the constantly person changes. was. Yeah. Yeah. This information constantly changes, and there are people who, we still haven't figured out what a good case is for people to start cooking more. I, I, I seriously don't know if there is. I mean, if you're in a point where you can still obtain the calories, but I think food IQ, the, you should not think chocolate milk comes from brown cows. I, well, I, I think it's, I think it's like a lot of subjects, like you know, philosophy or whatever. It's like you don't have to know every detail of every philosopher ever. I obviously don't, but it's like you should have some base understanding of like, okay, what did this like? You know, is reality subjective or is it objective? You know, is reason something that we can use to figure out reality? Or is it just our social construct to use that term of reality? Like I think, I think it's a, it's worth at least thinking about that stuff, you yeah. know, even on a base level. Like you know, I was just reading, for example, there's an excellent book on uh, postmodernism. I've been telling you and our friend and whoever else about. We can provide a link to that below. Um, but you know, talking about the whole evolution of it, like, oh, reason existed as a way of sort of going against religion, but then there were people who wanted to essentially preserve religion. So they had to redefine reason in a way that was compatible with religion. So you had someone like Immanuel Kant who had the phenomenal realm, which is the realm we pick up with our senses, sight, smell, sound, taste, whatever. But then there was the new, new menal realm. I've heard it, yeah, I've heard it pronounced different ways, but uh, you know, where it's like, oh, this is the realm of religion, we just can't know it. But then you had someone like Hegel who said, reality, we can know the metaphysics of reality, but the metaphysics themselves are contradictory. Like. God is one but three, um, the universe has a beginning but the universe is eternal, um, God is a perfect being but creates evil, those sound like contradictions, especially using Aristotle's logic, but that's just the way reality is. And so then that gets in, then you, you, know, you get further and further into this, and like Stephen Hicks who wrote this book said, it's like, it's one of those things that you get into philosophy, it's like you have all these questions, but then it, you just end up asking even more questions, because you go further down that rabbit hole and it just starts, you know. Now, with we're talking about the philosophy. I know, I know, how, this is kind of a further tangent, but yeah, that's no. no, good. Uh, we're talking about how philosophy develops in certain areas. So, why did certain areas develop certain philosophies, or go for go further in philosophy? And I wonder if there's a correlation with the areas that develop philosophy also have developed in other aspects, have maybe more more expressive cuisines is that also part of the thing or could it be a situation where you well, have certain environments where they didn't have the time to really if you're spending time with philosophy do you have time to be developing cuisines i mean of course there's probably different people in those in those societies yeah. whatever was happening in that society in that thought process the foods that people were eating the reality that they were living in the environment they were living in probably got them in similar situations where they could learn more about their foods and also learn more about just the the ment the the mental food that they were 
ingesting. Well, see, I, I just thought about something too, how like I was talking about France earlier and they had the whole divine right and so on. That's why the food was developed. But you think about it, England had the same thing. Yet England up until recent years, the food was very lacking, you know, bangers and mash, steak yeah. and kidney pie, very, you know, basic stuff. But they've had kind of a food renaissance, but that's because Indians moving there, you had a lot of French chefs came in open places and so on. So they, they kind of went through a food renaissance as it were, but that's because of other people coming in and they're more open to newer things. But then um, Japan is an interesting case too, because historically they were more sort of like closed outsiders, but then they start opening up with Meiji restoration and all that. But especially after World War II, a lot of Western food became popular there. And I think a lot of that had to do with the rebuilding and so on. But like the dish tonkatsu, that's a pork cutlet. You know, mm -hmm. in German, it's a schnitzel. The Italian, it's milanese, whatever. But, um, you know, that became popular there. But that was from that Western influence. Whereas in previous, you know, the previous centuries or so, it was just whatever they had there. So it's also how receptive they are and willing to, you know embrace uh, different things. I know with the French, the French are funny because what I've noticed is that they do embrace a lot of other things, but they try to spin it as being their own. Yeah. Like they say they invented, <laughs> they say they invented chowder and it's like, come on, nobody else living by the sea figured out, you get a pot and finish it. You know? <laughs> so then they're like, well, to be a chowder, it has to be cooked in a chaudron. It has to have pork product. It has to have seafood. It has to have cream and it has to have potatoes. So they're like, okay, that's officially a chowder, yeah. like New England clam chowder. But then you look at Manhattan clam chowder, that's tomato based. But then they're like, well, is that a chowder? But then you see today we have like corn chowder and stuff. So it's like, you know, it's like, okay, let's redefine things to fit our you know, view. Yeah. And then getting back to England too, it's interesting because like I was reading, I have one of Gordon Ramsay's cookbooks and he talks about how they used to always have French cheeses there because the French were considered the best, the French or the Italians. But he said in recent in recent times the British cheeses have gotten so good they've made up like half their selection. Mm -hmm. So they've developed and apparently England has started producing their own wine too in recent decades. I haven't tried it yet, but you think historically, I mean they obviously had the terrain and stuff where they just never did it. Yeah. They, they just had beer, ale, gin, whatever. Um I know I think gin like the quinine it had to do with sailors at sea and like staving off sickness and tonic and all that. But um, I think that's that's an that's an interesting to think, yeah. thing, thing to do. Just the history of foods. Oh yeah, just yeah, I'm a big fan the history of, this. of food and other things that I was just thinking. Just a basic thing. When you look at a berry and you just think, how many people died trying to figure out which berry was poisonous and which <laughs> one was edible? You know, what I mean, you have this situation where I repeat the story. I've, I might have said it before, but I was in Central Park with somebody and we're just looking at different plants and just thinking. The person said. Back in the past, people would know all these plants. They yeah. know every single plant here and the name and what, what the different uses are for it. Like you see these TV shows and somebody just goes in, oh, you've been cut, and they go and smash this thing. And they just, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. The, yeah. There's, this really, there's these two really good mangas I'll leave links to below. One is called Shogeki no Soma, which is like kind of like Iron Chef, but based in high school. It's this amazing cooking manga. And there's another one, uh, I forget what it's actually called, but... It's based in, I think, the World War One era in Japan, but there's this Ainu person who's... The Ainu, I think, were kind of indigenous tribes, indigenous tribe in Japan. But she, they go... The guy researched the Ainu history really well, and they kept actual books and lore about the plants and the things. They, so they really go into detail to how they were using different foods, cooking in different ways, or using things for healing. So... There's, there's things tied into this, you are what you eat, you are what you ingest, yeah. whether it's eating, whether it's ideas, whether it's you get cut and you put something on your, on your on yeah. some salve to prevent. It. So all these things that are tied in there, this is the history of man, the history of who you are, who builds you up to who you are, is very unique to certain areas. Now, one last thing to add on that. I'm trying to wonder why it's very easy for people to say, I have a favorite cuisine. They understand, yes, French food is different than, than Italian food. And you have a lot of people in certain parts of society who are, very, who are very fervent about their favorite kind of foods and knowing the differences in the foods. And I think if people understand how tied in the food is with the people, with the locations they came from, with the ideas, with the cultures that those people came from, they can also realize that there are differences in these cultures. Because you'll find a lot of people who will be very, who will say, no, that is not true Chinese food. Yeah. That's not true Japanese food. Japanese food is this or this. Yeah. Is, they'll know very many things about the actual cuisine. And a lot of these people will argue that, oh, the reason we need multiculturalism and all these things is because 
we get all these different foods from these different areas. These same people will be the ones who say, oh, there's no such thing as health. Health is this health at, yeah. every, at every size. Whatever you eat is the same. You know, they'll take that thing and they'll say, no, it doesn't matter if you eat like 20 hamburgers or some yeah. lettuce. It's just the same. It's just yeah. food. But no, there's different cuisines. There's different foods. If you understand these cuisines developed with different people, with different cultures, from actual realities there, yeah. I think if you get people to understand that and find a way to translate, they can also understand there's different languages, there's different cultures, there's different mindsets. Well, different, different philosophies. Yes. Like, like, for example, I know in some of the Asian cultures, like Koreans especially, they're more deferral to authority. But they say, someone explained to me that's born out of Confucianism, which is Chinese, but it went into Korea when they mm -hmm. Chinese took them over at various points. But, like, for example... The older generation is not so much the younger, but from who I've talked to and what I've seen, they're bigger on, oh, this older person told me something, I have to go along with it. Whereas here in a lot of class, I think in the West, like Britain especially, they're, they're more on, okay, we should question authority. But it's, it's one of those things where, oh, I was brought up this way, my family did it this way, I just tell us this is the way you do things. But then to somebody like me, I say, well, that's the appeal to authority fallacy. That's saying, oh, this person's in charge, they must be right. Whereas I see it as... Oh, if a person is more experienced and is older, we should listen to what they say, but it doesn't mean we should just blindly adhere to it either. But, okay, yeah. with that listen to what they say thing and that connection there, that deferral to authority, yeah. I think that also develops as a child. Yeah. I don't think, I've been over this, I don't think a kid can love their parent. They have an attachment to their parent in a way because, like, I think we might, he might agree on this, but... My current definition of love is love is from Stefan Molinari. He says this thing that yeah. he makes a good case for it that love is the involuntary, involuntary action, action to virtue, virtue yeah. if you yourself are yeah. virtuous. So a child can't be virtuous, but the child understands that my food is coming from this person is providing me my food, yeah. providing my shelter, teaching me about the world, mm -hmm. and they value that and get that connection. They have that deferral to authority. Right. Now, if you have a society where you're going to school, the government is giving you your food, they're giving you the directions of food, they're giving you your shelter, they're instructing you in your ideas. There's a deferral there. So now with these cultures, I you wonder feel if like you owe them yeah. because, yeah. I wonder if there's going to be a way to kind of see this kind of, you know, they have the shame, guilt cultures, and they have certain certain lines in different cultures that go on. Ostracizing yes. versus, versus um, what's the word? Exiling or, yeah. Is there going to be, a, I'm sure this is the kind of thing where you could find some correlations between certain types of political systems, certain types of societies, and the foods they eat. Maybe you had certain locations where the maybe the, the wealthy were a lot more reliant on the peasants or like at least India on the different the classes system, yes yeah. on the different right. classes to actually be involved in their feeding process yeah. so they couldn't necessarily just completely shun these people maybe they were more united together in yeah. the process of acquiring food and that's a basic thing at least it's one thing they do in africa i don't understand i don't know if, at least they do in kenya most african cultures i think it's not done that much in the west where if you enter somebody's home they almost always offer you something to eat. It's almost okay. like insulting for you to not leave the house without having something. Even if you're just dropping in for 15 minutes, they'll go back and forth. When I talk a chai, that's like, would you like some tea? They'll go back and forth with this thing. You'll be a banter like, oh, no. People will say, oh, I'm going to, I have to go, I have to go. And most of the time, even if you're stopping in just to drop something off, you'll sit down and take something. They'll find something to offer you. So could that be from more of an older society where... They're still closer to the time when if somebody was coming to visit you, likely were coming from far, expending a lot of calories. So it was kind of like a common thing. They took that effort to come there so you were feeding them so they could make it back. Or is it kind of a thing where you might run out of food? It's just so seen as common courtesy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Then you have some cultures where in the West, think somebody could come over, they can be there for hours and you don't offer them food. It's not necessarily considered rude if that was never the plan to have an actual meal. Well, I've noticed, too, even, like, in a lot of nicer restaurants, you come in, like, say I'm applying for a job, they'll be like, do you want a glass of water or something, or do you want a drink or something? Um, I know Danielle, one of the top restaurants in the city, um, even if you come into the bar to have a drink, they still send you canapes. Mm -hmm. Even if you're just having a drink, you don't have to order any food. Now, you go to a restaurant at that level, you're probably going to order food anyway. Yeah. But, like, it's cool that you can just come and sit at the bar, have a drink, leave, but they'll still send you canapes. So, are there certain cuisines that when you get there, there's not, it's not, is it the, the quality of the law, yeah. is it the quality of the restaurant or some places they don't give you, you know, there's free apps in some places, some places will give you some bread, some olive oil or something at some Italian places. But how recent is that whole, 
appetizer thing that's kind of thrown not appetizer but just biting the tasting things while you're ordering after you've ordered it's normally after you've ordered right well I, I would have that. to look that up I mean I know mm -hmm. like for example in the higher end restaurants they have what's called an amuse bouche which basically bouche for those that don't know it's the French word for mouth but it means yeah. a human mouth uh, amuse so tease, your, tease your mouth amuse yeah. your mouth it's supposed yeah. to sort of wake up the palate as it were whereas an amuse go go is an animal mouth so that's something more casual you'd have at a bar like peanuts would be an amuse go but you go to a higher end place an amuse bouche it might be like you know a slice of pate it might be you know a canopy of some kind like it would be a little more advanced you know okay um we've been talking for a while and i think it's probably trying to wind this down now <laughs> and um but yeah, it's it's gone well. I th I'm trying to think of probably next topic. I think I really like what you said about about a place like England getting in different kind of cuisines. Yeah, Great Britain, England, whatever. By having different people from different locations yeah. come in places, it's mostly places that they colonized, and then now people have moved there. The French, it's it's, it's ironic that it's the... we're not going to get into that right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, but it's ironic with the French because historically that's their main rival. Yet you have all these French people going there to open restaurants. Yeah, and then you know they hire British people, and there is some connection there. But yeah. is it British food? You know, it's still French food technically. And then like how it gets where to the they point where from, yeah. if you if you you go to a lot of restaurants here, I had this event, had this uh, it's really annoying conversation with somebody. It was more left pol politically talking about the immigration situation in the United States. It was like, yeah, if you kicked out all the immigrants, all the restaurants in New York would shut down. I, first of all, this is an American right here. He works in a restaurant. Uh, <laughs> people, Americans will work at restaurants. It's just that right now there is a lot of, I know there's a lot of illegal immigrants. There's a lot of migrants working these jobs and the wages are certain but no the restaurants won't shut down if this happens but but something i've thought right. about and this could be a topic for next time too but i've thought about as well as like how much of the process they could automate because a lot of the work in the kitchens it's repetitive labor cutting yes. vegetables whatever but i know you can order certain vegetables pre-cut there's even machines like with an onion there's a machine it slices down with these blades so you get perfect yeah. squares and what i'm wondering if in the future you know they're automating more and more stuff if you might have a chef who kind of oversees all this stuff but it's all this stuff is being automated he's just overseeing but he his job his or her job i should say is more to come up with the creations more to season things whatever mm -hmm. but there's actual machines or whatever doing the work itself he, i mean he just has more of a creative aspect it, we, it's, we are steadily going towards the point well, where you cars, have replicators you know? you know where you just have like the star trek thing where it's just literally just completely yeah. automated it takes the components and puts them together yeah. in whatever food you want you are the one who plugs that in and that goes back to the thing. Now, is that really, is that really worthwhile? Like, I'm not worthwhile, but well, what I, what, what, is, is that is that necessarily a bad thing to have that situation? I I personally don't think it is. You know, well, that's, the, I kind of wondered that also. Where I was thinking, look, I'm not against autom autom yeah. automa ah, automation. Automa automation, automation in certain things. So, if it's in the workplace, I don't mind that automation. Why do I mind it when? Why would I object to people not knowing how to cook? Because technically, you can automate it by having a robot doing it in the kitchen yeah. and then you pay some other human to hand it to you. Or you can automate it by having another biological robot, which is just us, doing it somewhere else. And then they directly... What does it matter if it's a robot making it in McDonald's or somebody being paid five dollars an hour to flip those burgers well the economist george reisman made a good point too he had an episode i think it was on tom woods's show talking about automation and they were saying like oh no if you automate all this truck driving you won't have any jobs for truck drivers but he made the point you still need to design things that would be delivered by trucks yeah. so that's what i was thinking with food is yeah you could have machines that carry out the basic tasks cutting the vegetables whatever straining stuff like very basic stuff but then you could have people that just come up with the creative stuff they can tweak recipes they can change things, whatever, but they, they, they're they the ones who actually have the say, and they can have dishes that come out perfectly the same way every time, free of error, but they can have the say in what those dishes are like. They're just not carrying out the physical labor. Okay, That's so what I, about. I think we've got two different topics we're going to go on. I personally would like to do this series, just have more talks yeah, and kind of focus on good. food and different subjects and things like that. So one of the subjects is automa automation in the food industry. And another subject I would like to touch on also is with the culture of the different foods. I'd like to focus on how cultures develop certain foods and what that has to say about the culture itself. When does something become of that culture? Why does some cultures have more developed yeah. foods and why? It's going more to the history of foods. And I think one of the keys was 
I thought about this a while back was why does what is American cuisine? You know, America they say it's a country of immigrants, was built by immigrants, and we don't understand that people come from different places. But what makes it American food? Because right now, as we discussed, if some people from France are leaving there and going to going to the UK to open restaurants, it's still French food. But if you go to a Japanese restaurant here and it's staffed by people from Honduras who have traveled here from Honduras, migrated here from Honduras, they're still cooking Japanese food. It's still probably going to be a lot of Oriental people eating that food because they still consider it Japanese food. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's their mom who makes it and all the food comes directly from Japan, but it's still the food. So what makes the food the food? Why do people like certain foods? How does it deal with them? So yeah, I think history of food and then... Future of food. Yeah, history yeah, of food is what we're talking about. Yeah, Future yeah. of food is the automation. Sure. So I think that's it. Uh, that's my, my last time. Like, have you give you the last word? No, we, I mean, we, we can go on about this stuff other times. I could go on and on, of course, but it's, <laughs> it's getting a little while. I don't want to lose anyone's attention with this video time. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so links in the low bar. And uh, till next time, thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for having yeah. me on. Look forward to it. Do it again soon. All right. Uh, like, share, and subscribe. Links in the low bar. Till next time. Bye. Talk to you soon.